Shall we start? Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, take your seats, please. Uh, we are resuming the uh, joint meeting of the uh, Delta Independent Science Board. Let's see, we have, are we on, on the air? Uh, looking back, at, we are on the air. Thank you very much. Uh, the joint meeting of the De Delta Independent Science Board and the Delta Stewardship Council. Kind of a new experiment for us, and I'm having more fun than I should. So uh, hopefully other people might be too. Uh, we've gone through part of the agenda, and I, I again remind you, Mr. Rustaller, who is chairing the uh, uh, Delta Protection Commission uh, festivals that start at 4 and the meeting at 6.30 or whenever it is, will have to leave early, and some other uh, council members and staff have talked about going down. So we'll try to uh, move through on this. So if you would be good enough to turn to I agenda item number seven, agenda <laughs> item number seven, uh, Dr. Hastings, Ms. Davenport. Thank you very much. Okay. Pull that a little closer to you. So, ah, there we uh, go. There you go. Thanks. Um, well, this is a great opportunity having the ISB and the council meeting together to follow up on the habitat restoration oversight session, which also um, Move the mic in front of you because we're also picking it up for broadcast and we want to make sure people can hear you. Okay. In Dinuba, San Diego, and Chile. All right. Great. Um, so again, we're following up on a session that was held in July of this year, Habitat Restoration Oversight, which was responding to the ISB's paper um, looking at science and adaptive management within habitat restoration um, in the Delta, and also hearing from people doing restoration projects and overseeing restoration programs. And we came up with a lot of interesting information, and we were asked to follow up with a report. And as we were thinking about how to follow up with you, um, we've thought about a matrix, because we know some of you really like matrices. But at the same time, we wanted to tell a story about what's going on with implementation, because there are a lot of really interesting um, groups getting together to talk about how to do habitat restoration in an effective way. So um, what this report does is sets out two of the key issues that were identified in that oversight session, one being the integration of habitat restoration with other Delta Plan goals, and the other being performance tracking. And um, one of the key things about the Delta Stewardship Council compared to a lot of other agencies is we do have this obligation to integrate habitat restoration with water supply reliability and the Delta as a place, including agriculture, recreation, and those other issues that have been even talked about just earlier today. Um, so within that general topic, um, one of the interesting things that's being discussed is the development of regional conservation strategies. And the way this fits into the Delta Plan is that we have identified in the Delta Plan the priority habitat restoration areas. We have six of them. And within those areas, there's been discussion um, within groups, including the Delta Restoration Network, about how to develop conservation strategies that not only take the ISP's recommendations about doing things in a coordinated way among restoration projects, but also, as ISB mentioned, to integrate these other activities on the ground, like agriculture and water management, including levees, drainage, um, infrastructure, like roads and bridges, and how does that all fit in to a vision for um, conservation? And one of the other things that I think is really important to remember is a lot of these areas are available for restoration because of the conservation work that's been done over the years through state law, um, federal in some cases, and then local laws protecting these areas from urbanization. And so there are stakeholders there who have a very strong interest in maintaining waterfowl habitat, maintaining agriculture, and this council has an opportunity to be supportive of efforts to integrate those kinds of actions and find synergy. And so um, there's, there's an interesting proposal being developed right now by the Delta Restoration Network of how to start bringing tools together to help us envision different scenarios for those 
priority restoration um, areas. Um, a second area that uh, several agencies have been meeting to discuss is agricultural land stewardship planning. So specifically looking at the issue of agriculture and how does the restoration community integrate agriculture into what it's doing um, at various levels, but including at the project level. So this group uh, originally, the um, Department of Water Resources convened an agricultural land stewardship work group, initially focused on um, potentially going beyond the mitigation required by BDCP. Um, but as the work continued in this group, it was realized, well, these are strategies and approaches that could be used now. Um, and so that group is um, looking at convening a, a working group to specifically vet some of the project level strategies for agricultural land stewardship planning, such as good neighbor policies and payments for ecosystem services into the restoration planning that's happening now and developing some guidelines that would be vetted among agricultural and restoration stakeholders and others. Um, and then um, on the other side of the um, set of issues, the second major topic we looked at was performance tracking. And we looked at that in terms of the three initiatives that, um, or the three levels that um, the Delta Plan has in terms of performance tracking. And one is the administrative performance measures and as well as the output. Um, and right now, the, um, the council staff is working to go through our, um, our CIPIS information system that tracks the projects going on in the Delta and looking at how to align those with the administrative and output performance measures in the Delta plan. And then as you heard from the Delta Conservancy at our last meeting, there is an effort to track restoration projects, even in the planning stages, because CIPIS only covers things that are already funded and ongoing. Um, but even at the, at the planning stages, to be able to have an, a GIS web-based system. So what they've done is they've gotten funding to expand the Eco Atlas, which is um, now used in other parts of the state, and uh, input data from the Delta so that anyone will be able to go on this website and see what all the different restoration projects are up to, what stage they're at, and eventually, once they are implemented, they'll, that can be linked to information about um, assessment of the performance of those habitats, and we'll be able to do uh, summaries of the total acreage of different habitat types and things like that. And then finally, moving up to the level of outcome performance measures, um, in some ways, this is kind of a holy grail, and people have attacked it from different angles. Um, and I don't think anyone is really settled on any final decision on what those will be. But there's some really great work going on to try to assemble different ways of looking at performance measures, um, one of them being the, the newly launched uh, California Estuaries Portal. And that summarizes some good information and uh, encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and we, um, through all these efforts, it's a collaboration between the planning division and the science program. And I didn't give Lauren much chance to speak, but we definitely have been working together and tracking all these efforts and trying to support them um, from both the planning and the science side of things. So uh, we welcome your comments. Before Lauren starts, just one thing to kind of factor in. I, I, I got interested in this subject. When I read the report, I thought it was a good report. I'd like to figure out if, if the staff collectively can find ways to have the council uh, receive reports from the science board, but particularly highlight those reports and kind of plug them into the system in a way that we would want uh, agencies that might come before us, for example, on a covered action, to include the multiple array of issues that are uh, in the Delta plan that are subject to that. I, I'm not expressing myself very well, but because this is kind of a new experience for us, we have to figure out how we're going to deal with 
what are special reports from the uh, science board, how we would plug them in. And if we can have a methodology that is worth replication in other settings, whatever that would be, I think that would be pretty important. And I talked about it a little bit, Phil, in some of the discussion yesterday, yeah. on Tuesday, um, was is there a way to maybe track some of the recommendations that the ISP has made to the council, make sure we're not losing sight of what the, what the suggestions were, and then whether or not there's been a, a response or actions taken based on those. Well, maybe we just post on the website uh, the uh, five items on a... Uh, dashboard light thing and there's a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. And you just have that going. And nobody will know what it means, but like the daughter more green lights. More green lights the better. Lights for Randy. I'm for it. I'm for it. Okay. Dr. Hastings, I'm sorry I interrupted you as you were about to speak. Oh, no. no, I'm just here to help with any questions. <laughs> So I think I'll open it up to the ISB members. I think one of the reasons for having this item on the agenda is to get an update as to the habitat, our review of habitat <coughs> science, restoration science, and how effective that review was, how well it's factored into some of the um, planning and the process that's coming out of that. Um, so for those of you, John, you were the uh, lead author, but other, we were all pretty heavily involved in this habitat science restoration review. Um, how do people feel in general about the, our comments and how they see them reflected in some of this progress report on habitat science in the Delta? Go ahead, John. I knew you. Oh, Judy, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh. My comment is later. Okay. Well, I think it, uh, it's, <coughs> it's easy to say it's too early to tell. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that. <coughs> One of the things that, that I felt was very important that we were drawing attention to was the, the fact that habitat restoration projects can't be conducted in isolation from one another. And it sounds like that's something that is being discussed now. Uh, discussing it is, is obviously the first step, but trying to, I mean, it's just like the Delta Science Plan. It's like all these things we've been discussing when you have different entities undertaking the actions trying to get them to integrate the actions and recognize that somebody else is doing something that's going to influence the success of what we are doing that's <clears throat> that's very difficult uh, in any situation particularly in something like the Delta and particularly in something where the the directional flow of water uh, which can go both ways is uh, is both a facilitating and a complicating aspect of trying to integrate habitat restoration. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm, I really want to emphasize the importance of trying to, to move ahead on that integration, even if it's just you know, two or three projects at a time, getting them to, to talk together and getting them to basically have coordinated planning for the projects uh, that are already underway uh, are being planned. One of the other things that <coughs> we called attention to, and I think it, it, it haunts us on everything we deal with, uh, with reference to the Delta, is how are climate change and sea level rise going to be factored in? And obviously for a lot of these habitat restoration projects, which are uh, all uh, intertidal, uh, potentially subtidal, uh, supertidal, they are all sensitive to both the climate change inputs from above in the watershed and the influence of sea level rise. And as we pointed out in our report, when we talked with people, this wasn't news to them. They knew that the climate was changing and that sea level was, it was due to rise, but there was not a lot of evidence that that was being factored into how they were planning restoration. What were their contingencies? And you may not know, I mean, there's obvious uncertainty in terms of the projections of models, 
So you may not know precisely how much sea level is going to rise, but you know the window within which it's going to rise, the probabilities. And I would like to, to see some real movement involved in pushing people to really incorporate those factors into habitat restoration, because there's a potential there that some expensive and well-meaning, well-intentioned habitat restoration may end up being totally ineffective yeah. because the gains are, are simply eradicated by sea level rise and uh, climate change. I can respond a little bit. Um, yeah, I think we're seeing this restoration network and the restoration framework that's being developed is key to addressing both of those issues. Um, and the... Uh, the framework, well, actually the network just in and of itself, getting all the, or most, I think we still need to get a few more participants involved, but most of the restoration practitioners involved in that network is a big first step. And right now I've been, I've, I've mentioned this before, but um, pleased with the participation and the level of participation there that they're all willing to come and discuss what they're doing sharing information with each other, that people just see value in that in and of itself. But now we actually are working with that group to develop, um, you know, we've got an early stage draft restoration framework um, that will identify principles, including some of the principles that you've described. I mean, I've got a draft right here. All restorations are affected by restorations that come before and after. You know, things like that are elements of the framework that we're putting together and getting people to realize that and understand that. Um, and from the science program perspective, this is one of the big issues that we're trying to tout all the time is the bigger picture view, the landscape scale approach that's in the Delta plan um, and bringing that up. And I think we, we will have opportunities in working with the network and developing the framework and also in the covered action process, you know, we, we actually had our first early consultation on a, I guess we can talk about, early consultation on a habitat restoration project, and this issue came up of how projects affect each other, and the issue of um, sea level rise came up as well, which is addressed in the Delta Plan in terms of the elevations. You know, one of, if you recall the elevation map, that's being used uh, for Delta Plan Policy ERP, is it two, um, I think, yeah. ERP two, um, it, that came from the formerly Fish and Game, now California Department of Fish and Wildlife, but it has an area called uh, sea level rise accommodation, I think is the label that's being used. And one of the main purposes there is for people to be aware of that, and even though there's so much pressure to scrape down elevations today to achieve intertidal habitat, that people need to recognize the value of that um, upland, what's now you know, just upstream or up tide, tidal uh, prism of that at area. And in fact, that's we've talked about this before, but you know, the project we were looking at, which is the Lower Yellow Ranch project, actually has modified their design um, for many reasons, but it also is helping with, with that issue. So those are just some of the ways that I think we're already working to achieve some of the issues that you did talked about. Uh, two comments. Uh, uh, one, uh, about the regional conservation strategies, it seems like a really good idea. That's what they're called, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and... Um, but one of the things I remember from an earlier ISB meeting, we had a presentation showing how um, actions way up in the watershed could impact down here and even how actions down here will impact way up there. So there's some danger in only thinking regionally. And I'm sure, and I would hope that those regions would interact right. to, re to realize that that's the case. Well, what I should yeah, bring up is the... Um, the approach we're taking right now is to have a single restoration framework, and then there are we're going to be are six regional conservation strategies. So the idea is to 
um, to emphasize looking bigger picture across all of them, you know, system wide by having just one common restoration framework um, and one common meeting place for discussing that. Good. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So point number two is, I, I was so I did go to the state of the estuary conference, and I was so struck by the progress that Baylands has made, and. Uh, it seems, and one of the things they have are really good performance measures, and 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 it seems to me that and and agreed upon the goals early in the process, and so we're seeing it what ten years later or something, and and there's so much to be learned from that. I mean, it really gave me great hope actually that they seem to have made considerable progress and um, I spoke afterwards with uh, some of the folks involved and they said yeah a lot of the fights occurred 10 years ago and now they're you know we're making progress anyway so so I think so interactions with them may be a really use and I'm, I think somebody's giving a, a brown bag or already has or something anyway I think that's a really I think we, there's something to be learned from what they have accomplished yeah and I think that um we have a really great opportunity to do somewhat similar work in the Delta through the Delta Landscapes Project that you've heard um, Robin Grossinger and his uh, collaborators work on. So we're, we're hoping that that can um, lead to similar kinds of consensus around how to do restoration in the Delta. I think we do have a, a somewhat different situation, um, which I don't have to go into detail, but... Yeah, the um, the regional concert. I, I'm hoping anyway that the regional conservation strategies are the place to establish those visions for the landscape, and we're going to incorporate the the historical ecology work and the and the delta landscapes work that SFEI is doing, and that's the place where these landscape scale conceptual models that are described in the delta plan are expected to be housed or within those regional conservation strategies. Um, but, yeah, another, I mean, maybe I could talk a little bit more about what the, the vision right now is, I and mean, we will see where, where we get. But the proposal on the table in the um, draft restoration framework is if there's two big parts. One, the regional conservation strategies, and then the second is what we're calling a, a hub right now, a common place for interested parties to get together um, when, when restoration activities are, are going to occur, uh, for folks to do the gaming, do, do the planning, so that if we can provide the tools, GIS-based tools, that Jessica was talking about, that not only are thinking about restoration, but they're thinking about agriculture, recreation, the economy, infrastructure, um, where are all the levees, where are the water uh, supply opportunities, you know, what are the impacts going to be, but get the, um, it, and it, it's a place where management and science can come together to do gaming using these tools to hopefully get us closer to agreement on, on how to approach restoration that's required today and that we think could be uh, additional restoration that could be required in the future if, if the BDCP is, is approved. Mr. Chairman, that, that microphone is terrible. Vince, are you still on? Are you trying to say something? Oh, my. No, not, I'm on, but okay. You're you're partly on. Okay, well, uh, Liz. You know what? Uh, the, my, Tracy, the microphone that Lauren's using doesn't uh, uh, translate very well. That's what I was I was oh, trying to. Is it, is it too far away? Okay, well, we'll have her try and speak. Okay. Closer to the microphone. Understand that you're speaking to French Polynesia right, as right. well as. Um, I'll, I'll try. Is that better, Vince? I, I moved the mic closer. By the way, we, Vince, just so you know, Arcade is specially requested to work with you in the French Polynesia. <laughs> <laughs> Liz? Hopefully, I'm on now. Um, I think this is great. I'm really happy to hear about the. Uh, Develop, development of the regional conservation strategies. I think that's a, just a wonderful step in the uh, direction that our review recommended, um, and also your efforts to consider performance tracking. I just have a, a couple of follow-on comments um, that some of my colleagues mentioned. So one is the uh, 
the importance of climate change and realizing that the Delta is a dynamic and changing system. And I feel like of all the uh, dimensions of climate change, the ones that uh, have sort of been uh, given the most attention in restoration is the sea level rise issue, but, but there are other dimensions of climate change. And so just to think about climate change in a more holistic way, such as changes in freshwater delivery, precipitation, uh, timing of flows, temperature. So, so anyway, just to be more holistic about when thinking about climate change. And then uh, I think another thing we identified was the uh, striking a balance between taking advantage of opportunities but holding on to the grander holistic vision. So um, anyway, as your work in the regional conservation strategies group progresses to, to try to uh, revisit that and, and think about both the opportunities as well as the, the big picture. Um, another thing in that report that uh, was important, at least to me, was the use of modeling and uh, a range of models. So both conceptual models that allow groups to envision how their action will cascade into different responses, but also larger, the use of sophisticated models. I think we had a recommendation about considering um, a modeling bank. I'm not sure if that's the right language, but basically that the trying to bring the modeling community together and to, to really use the full value of the model development in the Delta. And then finally, just to remind, to also talk about, there are some structural issues which I think that you should continue to think about. So for example, one of them that came up was the issue of crediting. And you know there was a lot of concern about um, whether projects that were undertaken undertaken would be use could be used to credit um, I guess the uh, the biological opinions is the the main one so uh, I guess just being cognizant of the fact that there are structural challenges that need to be addressed too. Yeah, and um, we're hoping to follow this up with a um, another paper talking about some of those structural issues that still need to be addressed, like land acquisition processes, permitting, and the crediting issue. So stay tuned for that also. We, we thought we would start with something positive, some progress, um, before bonking people <laughs> with some... Uh, criticism. But um, yeah, we're definitely thinking about those issues as well. And I, I think the, um, the Delta Restoration Network is also really concerned about those and talking as a group and um, looking for ways to engage the, um, the agencies that are responsible for crediting and the regulatory community to make sure that um, we improve the processes as we move along. So we'll go to Brian, myself, John, and Phil, unless Phil is able to overrule us since he appointed us. I don't know how that works. Okay, that's the order. Okay, on, on this matter of we, so sometimes the we refers to Delta Science Program staff, and in other cases it refers to this restoration network as a, as a group. I, I'm curious to know more about the, the, uh, the network. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think it's Lauren who said that there were many, you you're, you're pleased by the um, participation. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could say more about that. And, and then also from the state agency side, <coughs> um, uh, as, as the network participants look down the road, do they see that they have the, the, um, the, the staff that they need? Are they able to attract and hold the qualified people to carry out these um, projects and 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 the adaptive management that goes with them, and to have access to the journal articles and all that kind of stuff. These are this is a structural issue of its own. Uh. The 
Yeah, the restoration network right now is being convened by the Delta Conservancy, Campbell Ingram, and is Campbell here? Oh, Crystal. And Crystal. Well, we could have Campbell talk more about it, or I can. Campbell will correct all my mistakes. Um, but. <laughs> Campbell, come on up to the table. <laughs> and, and what I don't know is how long they've been meeting, but I'll just put in my little plug from the, I, the, the meetings I've attended. Um, but, but right now the participants include um, the state and federal water contractor, state and federal, yeah, SWIFCA. Byron Buck comes to those um, from the Department of Water Resources. The Chief Deputy Director, Laura King-Moon, comes, and the Deputy Chief Deputy Director, Paul Helliker, comes. So I'm trying to show you the level of folks that come. Carl Wilcox from California Department of Fish and Wildlife comes uh, regularly, I think, routinely to those meetings. Um, and those are some of the key players that are going to be implementing restoration in the Delta. Leah Winternitz of the uh, Nature Conservancy comes. Um, let's see, there are folks with the, um, so yeah, Campbell can, yeah. 16 agencies, that are, uh, 16 agencies that are um, participating and more that are sort of on a list that we want to encourage to participate. We've been, we've actively sought to get the Delta community into that discussion. Um, we've got Doug Brown from the county's coalition who's participated and we've recently, um, been talking to some of the Melinda Terry and RDs, and so the, the concept here is get as much local community participation in as well. Going to your question about structure and coordination with the science program, um, there's Chris Enright and Lauren have been, and, and Jessica have been actively engaged, and I think we really are at this point, we've, we've got a draft framework that sort of frames up high level conceptual how we're going to create these structures and, and the the things that we need to have an effective system, and we're going to continue to vet those, but then start going out and meeting individually with the different organizations and sort of lay out concepts and then even scenarios about how things might play out in the future so that we can sort of compare and contrast and think about how we might structure. Well, I was just going to add um, other participants are several representatives of the consulting firms that do the des actual yes. designs. Stuart Siegel comes, um, Eric Guinea comes, Michelle Orr has come. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's also important. But right now, this is strictly voluntary. This is folks come because they see value in it, and, and so, which is great, and we just need to continue that momentum. So the, what about the second part of that question about this, oh. the, the state agencies and, and their, their capabilities down the road? Well, I think, that's, I think that's part of the reason that people are participating is out of recognition that currently we don't have the structure we need to be able to implement restoration at the scale contemplated by the Delta Plan and the BDCP. And so I think there's, I think that is the driving force that's bringing people together to help identify what are the tools we need, what's the structure we need um, to be effective into the future. So, um, you know, a real, you know, we're, we've started to vet what are in these conservation strategies. Our, 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 our general approach here is to bring people together to highlight the gaps and better understand those gaps and then start to think collectively about, okay, what do we need to do to get things in place to fill those gaps? So it'll be a process. I think the answer to the question is our ability to implement at scale is challenged on many, many levels. And so that, that's the need for this group is to really start to vet those things and figure out how we can be effective. So I wanted to ask uh, Jessica, I'm glad you pointed out about this tracking restoration outcomes at the regional level is the Holy Grail. And none of us know quite where the Holy Grail is or what it's going to look like when we see it. Um, but that is, I mean, that is why there's tens and twenties of thousands of acres of habitat restoration planned and, and ongoing. What's the, so in general, I'm curious, is there some level of accountability for that, for this? Restoration actual outcomes is it measured in, in fish? Is it measured in water? Is it what's it measured in, if anything? Or is it, it much more likely it's probably some conceptual 
framework by which we say if we get these outputs from our performance measures, we estimate these outcomes that we aren't going to be able to measure for quite some time. But who's thinking at that level and who's developing that sort of a metric? Is it the resource agencies or who that's actually given thought to that part of the equation? Because that's really what we're doing this for, and that's, that's ultimately what counts. How will we know if we're actually getting there? Well, I'm actually hoping that becomes one of the items on the science action agenda. Um, I think there's a lot of people who want to be involved. It won't just be a science enterprise. Obviously, it has a policy management and political components to it. Um, so we hope to work really closely with the Delta Restoration Network, the science program, the, our planning division. Um, and basically right now, the, the way the planning staff is approaching performance measures is we have the performance measures in the Delta Plan, which were admittedly um, created on an interim basis, and we hope to refine them over time. But the way that we hope to do that is um, I think we're – we have basically a strategic track for that second process. And in the meantime, there are things we know that are important that we have put in the plan, and we will be tracking those. Um, but then those connections, I think maybe Lauren can say a little bit about what the science program is thinking in, in terms of developing the, the larger scale. I know we're also um, working with San Francisco Estuary Partnership on a state of the estuary report that would be more like the public view of the indicators um, because historically they've focused more on the bay indicators and um, yeah maybe you can say more about that yeah I was going to start with um, right now I think you all are aware of this but a key driver are the acreage targets in the biological opinions and so the performance measure there is, as far as I'm aware, acreage of this type of habitat. And, of course, we want to go beyond that into outcomes, biological outcomes. Um, and so, and I believe within BDCP, that's one of the big challenges there is for the assurances is to go into the outcome category. But that's, you know, that's hard. To, especially as you all know, to draw those linkages between restoration outputs and those biological outcomes. It's, it's very challenging. Um, so, yeah, I think what we're, our view is that there are these efforts that are mentioned in the report that are taking a stab at already looking at outcomes, the estuary portal, um, and then also this Delta uh, monitoring program effort, the regional monitoring program, um, which right now isn't looking at habitat per se, but we're, we're actually hoping that we can get either that effort or something like that in a regional monitoring approach to habitat restoration outcomes as well. It just seems to make a lot more sense when we talk to the folks that are implementing restoration, they all agree, you know, that would makes more sense. So that's another issue that we're going to be pushing um, along the way. So that's kind of in pretty early stages right now. I want to draw the discussion back to uh, the, the science board, the Delta Science Program, and, and all that, uh, because I think this is one of the few areas where I think we have a chance to help accelerate the pace of restoration activities over what it might otherwise be and to make some better policy sense out of it if we utilize the tools that are already there but, but bring them together in a different way. So, for example, the paper that the Science Board produced I thought was terrific. I, I left my copy upstairs. But you also explained to us, if I remember some of these statements, you explained to us in that that restoration opportunities, particularly if they are called mitigation, are often lost to 
vest pocket mitigation that is not related to larger concerns. And you drew our attention to the interconnected habitat and the cross-jurisdictional problems, you know. Uh, if a development's going to touch the city of uh, Sacramento's boundary, the city of Sacramento looks at that and says, ah, oh, that's great, we get some money for our park system, as if that is the purpose of it. So when the paper came in, it was just very suggestive. It happened to occur at about the same time the state water contractor said we wanted to give uh, the council a briefing on the South Yolo project. Uh, and we devoted an hour, hour and a half. I thought it was a terrific discussion because as opposed to all the theoretical stuff, it was big, powerful interest groups come in. They own the property. It's already in a floodplain, but it can be improved as habitat. And yes, we're thinking of, you know, all that stuff. Everything's tied together. And then Peter popped up during the discussion, if I remember correctly, and said, well, you know, not far away is McCormick Williamson and the Meadows and the Consume This River Preserve, and you've got the statutory <coughs> obligation to deal with interconnected habitats. And I said, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's interesting because it blends things that are on their way to happen, some things that are on the way to happen on their own, but aren't moving all that fast. Some are moving fast, others are just there. It involves property that is largely in public ownership, not in uh, or nonprofit ownership, like McCormick Williamson's The Nature Conservancy. And it involves state policy decisions like the Consumnus River Preserve and Delta Meadows, which is the a major boating recreational opportunity, snack smack dab in that kind of ring of interest in the North Delta. <clears throat> and the principles outlined in the paper directly relate to that. But I think to get the attention of policymakers, one of the things that's important is try to give policy life to the to the larger planning documents. You know, my experience is planning documents are eternal in development. I mean, if we waited for the infinite planning, I'm, I should give the Jerry Brown speech I heard him give when he was governor in his first term. I hate planning documents. I've never met a planning document that did anything. But there's a limit to the effect of planning documents. So I wonder whether it isn't possible to think about the notion that when the science board is thinking about um, the, this evaluation of habitat restoration and, uh, activity, going on now, and an inventory of that activity, all of which is essential stuff. There couldn't be concurrently a short, and I mean short like four pages, a thought piece, an occasional paper, a rest, an example, so that all of you smart scientists who all say these things in different papers or occasions or hearings would say, Here's a, here's a restoration opportunity of key value. And the paper identifies YOLO, I guess Liberty Island's next, and then McCormick Williamson, and then the Meadows, and then the Consumnus River Preserve, all of which are within one of the six territories we've identified. But they are more understandable to people because... What Campbell's really doing is trying to bring together all the interested parties. But, of course, when you bring together all the interested parties, they, uh, uh, they assume that the state is offering endless amounts of money to do everything all the time, as opposed to this process where the contractors know the importance of it. Not, it's not a, and it's not just a BDCP thing. In fact, the South Yellow Project is not BDCP. It is related to the biological obligations currently underway. Now... There's a, there's a note where if we had gotten the combination of Peter's uh, illustrations of how you look at a target, South Hill or something, and you can see smaller things that make it more valuable than it is standing alone, although it is valuable standing alone. Now, that's really in, that's interesting stuff. Um, and... I just to add, it fits with the regional conservation strategy, but it gives life to it. And so just as a suggestion, I think the board ought to be encouraged, asked. I'd love to see your I don't know, putting ideas in play of how the principles might work in a real-life situation. Because we're in a time now 
where action is starting to occur. And our job is to try to make it as good a collection of actions as possible and make them happen faster than might otherwise be the case and not wait for a perfect ideal planning of every possible scenario in the world. And I make a, this for one additional example. Apart from climate change, which I think is fine, but that is not the main driver for me. Urbanization is the main driver. These opportunities are being threatened all the time. Uh, the Sacramento, the, 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 the string of projects is YOLO in Sacramento County. But Sacramento LAFCO was just recently uh, asked to expand the acreage for urban development on Elk Grove by 8,000 acres. They turned it down. That butts up right against the Consumers River Preserve. It would have, substan would have had substantial impacts on the value. I mean, the point is <clears throat> to minimize the impact on private property owners, to maximize the state investment and the local investments and contractors' investments, it's, it's, it's shaping those ideas that is as important as a set of planning principles that you rely on others to derive. And yeah, it, this is just like our earlier discussion. The first people out of the box get beaten up and yelled at and every problem can be raised. But it gives focus to the discussion in these agency meetings. It's an, is it an advocacy piece? Yes. But I think it's a scientifically proper advocacy piece as opposed to the Friends of Stone Lake, like, which I was involved with, we just were interested in Stone Lakes without regard to much of anything else. Nice thing to do, but we didn't maximize the habitat. So I mean, it just, this just seems to me to offer great opportunities for all of us. I guess my question is so you, that issue of, of additional opportunities by looking beyond the projects, we've articulated that pretty well. Isn't that reflected in the restoration framework pretty well? Or do we need to be doing more along the lines of what Phil's suggesting, like saying, specifically take what Peter was illustrating and write it up and say, make sure we look at these broader opportunities. Is, is that additional step, would that be more helpful than what we've got already? Well, this is just my uh, interpretation of what Phil said. So Phil can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I'm interpreting it as great. There's this restoration framework being developed by the network and involving scientists and, and planners and locals. But wouldn't it also be helpful to have the science board highlight aspects of it and get it out into... Do a test run of an idea. A, yeah, the, yeah. So you're talking about on the ground something. Again, using publicly owned or non-profit owned properties as an illustration is the, is the first way to start. You'll identify a thousand problems. There are always a thousand problems. But that's where the action is going to take place on its own anyway, but it will be largely uncoordinated because that's just the way the world works. But the, the, the advantage of the framework you pointed out, the advantage of these six areas, is you can do semi-coherent planning over time. Not coherent, just semi-coherent. That's miles better than what we do now. Good. Um, I, I really like the suggestion because one of the challenges in what we're trying to do is trying to make people understand that the expectation here is not that we have to in any way stop and do this planning. We, we clearly need to do a great deal of very detailed planning to have effective restoration programs over the next 40 years. But we've tried to, to as a founding principle, to say that Concurrently, we're going to need to be moving projects forward, and we need to make sure that we're steering those projects to the best available guidance to make sure that that, that happens. But it's there. There is a perception out there always that we want to plan indefinitely. So I think this this would help immensely to to focus that this is concurrent. We need to move forward. We need to make progress now, but we also have a good deal of work that we need to do to make it function better in the future. And, and the authority of the scientist will make people pause and at least think about it in a way that all of you know the council statements do not do. I, I think this is just great. I'm, this is uh, moving along really nicely and, and has a, some really nice positive aspects to it. Um, I think maybe I'd, I'd suggest also supplementing these short pieces with uh, another one showing 
what happens if we do these things in an uncoordinated way? There's some really nice things that we've talked about here about tidal energy being dissipated in the wrong place for our long-term thinking. Um, that's, I, I, I think we should highlight those kind of aspects as well. Um, you need to have the good and the bad, I think, to, to motivate people along. Yeah, I was just going to add that when we had our early consultation meeting with Byron Buck on the Lower Yolo Ranch project, because they're involved with projects in Sassoon Marsh also. And so one of the key issues is, is tidal prism and tidal energy. And so Byron, because their group is active in the cash flow area where lower, and, and the lower bypass, but also in Sassoon Marsh. So he, because he's looking at that bigger picture himself, he's very aware of this issue. And they are um, cognizant of that, that, that they could have stranded investments in terms of that tidal energy. You know, when they get Lower Yellow Ranch out the door and have a certain, you know, tidal motion there, that if they breach some levees in Sassoon Marsh on a significant enough area of land, it, it could affect that project. So Basically every... Every tidal marsh that we're looking at is living off the same tidal energy. Yep, exactly. And, that, and that's one of our key messages that we're trying to get out by, you know, p pulling these groups together to just provide that awareness. It's a, it's a zero sum resource, more so than even than money. I, I have one other example that I ran into some years ago. In North Carolina in the late 80s or early 90s, uh, the Department of Transportation was involved in a heavy expansion program and they were running into the typical 404 core permit for wetland stuff uh, process which slowed it down. I don't know the precise genesis but over time the transportation department and the North Carolina environmental department whatever it's called entered into a joint to a, a mutual agreement on the concept that in advance of the highway project being proposed, the highway folks department and the uh, resources department would mutually plan and identify mitigation sites which might possibly be used in the hopes that that would be uh, speed up the process. They invited in a collaboration of land trusts in North Carolina and they did, I don't know, a couple of years, identification of project sites. And there was no money currently being spent on the highways but they put the, the kind of projects identified. Campbell, this is not unlike what you're in the midst of, of, of trying to do. The ideas that seem to have the imprimatur of the transportation department, the resources department, and a host of, uh, of um, land trust was kind of put on the shelf as, for lack of a better word, approved projects or projects that might look like they meet the test of law and requirement. And then they somehow sucked the Army Corps of Engineers into signing a joint powers agreement. Anyway, Kennedy Institute gave them an award in 1996 or something like that for inventive government. And the pre-identification of sites that have potential seems to me to help move past this, how do we get agencies to work together? I've talked to Randy about whether... That isn't the kind of thing that couldn't be urged upon state and federal agencies in this muddle of planning that's going on now. And our six areas are pretty big and pretty disparate, and they need a lot more detail. So there's just another example for your consideration. So are there any other comments from ISB members on this? Update on the habitat. I'll recognize the council. Thank you. I, we've nibbled around the edges of monitoring in this discussion, but I wanted to zero in on it because it was highlighted two or three months ago by panels, and, and including one John you were on, uh, that came before us talking about the need for extensive monitoring project by project and how burdensome it is cost-wise to do that. And the suggestion was that there needs to be some more um, system-wide monitoring. Can the ISB report to us or comment on the potential for some greater system-wide monitoring as opposed to 
these very expensive requirements project by project. Go ahead, John. I mean, we, we did talk about monitoring the need to be more systematic. I think we've touched on that point almost in passing in several reports. I, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense. If you get down to doing situation-specific monitoring, you're, you're simply going to get killed. You'll n never get what you want. Monitoring is hard enough to convince people that it is worth doing for more than a year or two to begin with. The way out of that is to uh, have uh, a, a tiered framework for monitoring where you have an almost an umbrella sort of monitoring that is the, the simple, easy way to monitor broadly. And then you drill down where you really need that specific information, but you don't do the drilling down unless you have already determined that the information you're going to get from it is really going to inform your actions in adaptive management in terms of performance measures for habitat restoration. Uh, we have talked from time to time of putting together a white paper or something like that on monitoring. Uh, we haven't done it, and I'm certainly not volunteering that we should do it, because as soon as I mention this, I see Phil kind of light up and we say, thank okay. Thank you for volunteering to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add to that, that uh, I know up at Puget Sound, we've been talking about this. We've all got the same issue in these large ecosystem restorations. You want your, ideally, you want your monitoring to be done by a, a group that's focused on the monitoring and on the outcomes and on the outputs that you're hoping to get from your regional projects. You don't want your project proponents and constructors to be the ones doing the monitoring. Um, number one, it, it, it really compromises the appearance of objectivity if there's potentially a vested outcome in how the monitoring looks. So you really do want to have people that have, you agree with your restoration framework, what your monitoring outcome, what you're going to try to get from your uh, large aggregate actions, and then you figure out who's going to do it and how you're going to fund them and support them. I mean, I, that's the best way to do it. I think we would all pretty much agree on that. Except Liz, she disagrees. Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> and then we got Joe, and Judy, yeah, I, and I, Ryan. I, I totally agree, Tracy. Um, I just wanted to mention, added to that, is the um, consideration of time frame. So especially um, when you look toward a model of using restoration for outcomes, ecosystem functions, rather than acreage, um, some of this monitoring may have to take place over long time frames because the um, responses to those actions may not be realized initially. So, so that's another dimension to thinking about it is, you know, by if we if we do have an independent group that can do the mo the monitoring, they can also monitor um, for longer time periods than what an individual project is likely to accomplish. It's a question rather than a comment. Which so, how is the restoration network dealing with this? Uh, I mean, I would hope that planning for monitoring is as important part of what you're doing as planning for doing the project in and of, in and of itself. How much are you talking about this? Um, the network has been focused lately on um, developing a framework. And, and thinking about what the contents of the regional conservation strategies ought to be so that they're living documents. Monitoring obviously plays a key part in that, but I think we would look to the Independent Science Board as, and the science program to, to come up with ideas and start to vet ideas about how best to, to accomplish it over time. So I, 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 th I don't think it's an area that, that the network has really delved into in a great detail yet. We're, we're pretty young. We've had about six meetings at this point. It has to be a big part of the a regional conservation strategy. I mean, that's a that's part of the strategy. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go yeah. with the uh, writer, and then I think Peter wants to see the entire follow-up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> so when you talk about monitoring, you know, I have been in different meetings. Always people talk about monitoring, but 
it's not a simple thing as probably talk about because you have to collect the data, you have to transmit, you have to have a repository, you have to have people who are analyzing them. So um, one, of, one of the things when you are talking, uh, developing a network, what you want to do is have have some type of a central repository where you have all the data and at least some people are in charge of these things otherwise data get lost and after some time you don't have anything left you know one of one of the things is that this LTER in, in uh, National Science Foundation they have been long-term monitoring and sometimes people kept records in in handbooks and now they cannot find them so it, it is not a, not a very good issue. But now, in, in this modern era, probably we should uh, do much better. So maybe, I mean, I like the idea of Phil having a test run with, with, a, with a, I presume you meant that a certain uh, small scale down version of some area and start doing it. So maybe the, now public agencies might have one or two monitoring stations, which are not enough. But then that area can be uh, really populated with some other monitoring stations and connected and use that as some type of a, a model to, to see whether the monitoring can be done effectively. The, the, the weather people, they do well because uh, there are private agencies monitoring weather. So it's much easier because they keep a very good tag on weather. But this kind of ecological modeling, I don't know what the, the status is. There, there's a little known work group that's been active for probably more than seven years and it's the wetlands monitoring work group of the California Water Quality Monitoring Council and they're actually developing protocols for monitoring that are cost-effective don't cost a whole bunch of money and can go on sustainably over the long run um, and with the forthcoming uh, approval or promulgation of the state's wetland and riparian area protection policy, the monitoring component will be embedded into that policy uh, to some extent at least. Uh, how it's eventually going to turn out is still an open question, but uh, the state water board is spearheading that and the, uh, one of the co-chairs is actually located in Campbell's agency. So. Uh, it's part of the restoration network, and the outcomes of that will also be in EcoAtlas, not just the number of acres, but also the condition assessment of baseline as well as over time. So there's hope. And, and just one minor th final word. It may be worthwhile just asking that group to either present at either the, uh, the council or at the ISB at some point in the future. Is that working? Yeah. Okay. And just perhaps to pull that together during the development of the science plan, you of course you weighed in very heavily as the independent science board. We probably had as many comments about that as any other topic. And so, as Reina says, there really are some very uh, interesting initiatives with some good thinking going on you know, the Water Quality Monitoring Council. There's probably several other which are pilot programs right now, really good stuff. It's grant funded. What's going to happen when the grant money goes away? And so that was part of the reason for thinking about the data summit. You, how do you manage the data? You know, presumably there's going to be a network of different databases. How do they talk to each other? Let's think about it now rather than trying to do multi-million dollar fixes in the future. The other thing which we heard very strongly from the science community is that this is a very rapidly changing system. And we need to be geared up to hang studies if there's a new invasive species, if there's a massive change in the physical configuration. So what is if you take a look at all of the monitoring data that's out there, what's our ability to understand these trends? What's our predictive capability with what we've got now? Where are the gaps? If you had to hang a special study on that overall framework, um, you, is it actually there or are we going to be trying to backfill big gaps in the future? So this is a, certainly a big topic. Uh, we had a brown bag last week, which was a part of this theme. 
uh, where the USGS came and spoke about some of their long-term monitoring, the advantages of continuous monitoring, and had some pretty persuasive uh, data and examples. So, so yes, I think this is a really big issue. My guess is in 2014, uh, there, there's several large um, uh, activities, and uh, Carol can jump in here, where we really want to get a handle on this. Because as Joe says, if you can be ahead of time in data management, it's so much cheaper than trying to do retrofit and forcing things to interface down the road. But Campbell, you might, you, your folks have been thinking about that a lot with Shakira. Do you have anything to add? I'm not sure I have anything to add other than I think it would be good to, to help everyone understand what the different efforts are in a, in a subsequent meeting because uh, Bay Delta Live just came out and that's a, a pretty amazing platform where all the data is accessible to the public. Um, and then there are models that we've been working with that look at how do we take all the disparate data sets and utilize um, a platform as well as the experts and, a, and an analyst to help answer really challenging questions. So there's a lot more computing power available today and there are platforms that are available. The challenge really is how do you, I mean, I think the summit will be very helpful in helping us collectively understand maybe what's our best trajectory and how do we, how do we best move forward. with uh, NSF on some of these initiatives, so but, but please follow that, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really useful if somebody can start uh, a test run or uh, a mock-based mock monitoring program and see how it can be worked. Because most people I have heard, you know, because this is such a vast, difficult problem, they talk about, then they come up with the protocols, and it, it's, it's a large... Uh, sum of data and it's, it's quite difficult to handle. So if you start with a small project in a, in a more rigorous basis, that can be the, the prototype for the rest of the, the large-scale monitoring. So maybe I, I strongly urge to, to follow that. Yeah. Thanks. How are, the, how are the questions that the monitoring network are employing to do to design their protocols and their monitoring, how are those questions coordinated between the science program and the different agencies? For the monitoring council? Uh, the monitoring council essentially, or the, this on wetlands in particular, uh, has three major questions. Where are aquatic resources located? How many are there? What type are they? And what condition are they in? And that the condition is the, the essentially the baseline. They may be pristine, they may be totally screwed up, but that's the baseline. And from there, you can apply protocols. Some of them are relatively fast and inexpensive as far as monitoring goes to evaluate progress over time as you restore, as you uh, uh, functions and processes in in the drainage area that, or the assessment area that surrounds them. And there are several efforts underway now that actually uh, follow the, the tunnel alignment pathway to assess baseline condition of existing resources to map them, where are they, and how will they fare over time. And I'm, I'm hoping that, to get back to Randy's comment earlier, that the permitting process for all of that can be the vehicle to make sure those monitoring efforts are sustainable. And I think that's obviously the, the critical item is that sustainability of monitoring. I think most of all of us who've been involved in this know that we haven't really achieved that in many places, and not on the scale we're talking about in the Delta. Um, so I think that the monitoring issue is one that the ISB has raised a number of times. How much attention is really being given to it? How independent will it be? Will it be properly resourced? And, okay, and that's something that I think we do have to um, continue to ask that question as we look at, at these big projects in the Delta, is the monitoring and whether or not it's being appropriately handled and resourced. Um, any other comments from ISB members on this 
Because what I, I just have one question I wanted to ask the council regarding this presentation and, then, and our report in July on the habitat science, the science of habitat restoration in the Delta. Um, you, you keep saying you found you find all of our writings extremely interesting and extremely <laughs> useful and very valuable. And if but is there value added that you would see, like yeah, as I, an example? I, I, when you I, said, I want to carry in my wallet a three by five card on monitoring for restoration projects, and I want to know the seven things to do. I don't need to know the details, but I want to. If the if the starting point is identify with clarity what success and failure means for restoration. I don't, or however you say it, that I can operate with. If the second point is don't let anyone convince you that you have to evaluate a thousand things when you actually have a project that's supposed to do two. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's that, I, you know, the, the seven commandments. Yeah, and let's say you're dumbing down science for people like me to understand, or more precisely, to help implement. And I believe that those principles are as important and maybe more important for starting things happening. And I believe we, don't, we won't know what a good adaptive management plan really means until after we've tried five, six, seven, or eight of them of various sizes and wrestled for a long time with, with the problems that result. But I know that until we start trying, so I think there's an opportunity. I bet in the next four years, maybe earlier, somebody's going to decide in a fit of legislative frenzy on bond spending, Campbell, you've got $40 million for restoration, and let's see, what do we say? Uh, $10 million in the North Delta, $10 million here. Don't screw it up. Now that, you know... Everybody laments it lacks clarity and purity, and that's the best the political system does, and that wouldn't be terrible. But where does poor Campbell turn? Not to a process to develop the measurements that, I mean, he needs to carry that list in his hand, too. The five, seven principles. Uh, 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 I'm trying to remember. The, se the seven-step path to public policy that uh, <laughs> uh, the guy down at uh, UC uh, Goldman School developed, you know, define the problem, accumulate the evidence, develop your alternatives, consider the trade-offs, you know, and all that. That's the stuff that public policy people imperfectly but will actually come closer to understanding. Yeah, but, Phil, when we taught together, you changed those high-minded principles to the ones that politicians actually use, which is read the headlines, write a press release, write a bill, ignore all input, take credit for it, move on to the next headline. <laughs> uh, that is, I said wake up in the morning, turn on the television set. The first yes, that is right. And there's a classic illustration of the difference between administrators and scientists and administrators and politicians who are, you know, we're episodic driven and we need that limited structure to think about. I mean, if I had thought when I was on the city council that budget requests from the police departments might reasonably be tied to the crime rate, I would have thought myself a genius. I didn't think of that ever in all the 14 years I spent in local government. It was just the cops come in, they demand the money, the crime's going terrible, you have to give it, and a year later they're back asking for more money because the crime situation hasn't improved. Hey, what's going on? Oh, so anyway, that, that stuff, that, that distillation of an idea, the illustration of an idea, actually is how you move the process along. And it's very compelling. It's very compelling. Because I want to get a a monitoring project where we have John Weems at the end of it and he's, he, has, he can only say yes or no to the question of is it good enough? <laughs> no maybe, no conditions, just yes. And you know what? After a while, that would become a process that gets developed out of some examples, becomes both more familiar and more sensitive and able to respond and you might actually see some ongoing intelligent decisions where scientists talk to each other representing all the parties and leave people like me out of the discussion and they resolve more than what's gone on before. So anyway, so, thank you. It was a fun discussion. So are there any other... Uh
Do we ask for public comment at this point? Yeah. yeah. 